Welcome to forward training for you guys. Uh, like I said, it's only going to take about an hour, and we'll get through this real quick. Uh, just want to go over the basic things you guys should be aware of when you're dealing with any kind of emergency on campus. Okay. Uh, one of the biggest things you're going to you're going to need to know is it's not enough to say to if something happens if there's an emergency to say that you know what I have a, a fire or there's some kind of hazardous materials hazmat spill over at Fred Kaiser. If you tell that to Ecom, they're not going to know what you're talking about. So it's really important that you know the civic address uh, on all of your documents, whether it be your building emergency response plan or within your red pamphlet book, which are located around your building here. You're going to notice that there's information in here and it'll tell you, it'll say building name and building civic address. When you phone into Ecom, they're absolutely going to want to load that civic address. They're going to type it into your computer and it won't come under Kaiser and it won't come under McLeod. Okay, they'll come over to that. And then that'll be sent to the fire department and then they'll be able to get here real fast. Okay. All right. Some of the emergency response information you're going to need to know. Obviously the name and number. Location of the fire or incident. So where does it happen? What's going on? Where, where, where is this fire? Okay. You're going to need to know the room number. Okay, if it's happening in one lab, it's very important you know exactly where that incident has happened. Okay, because you're going to have to relay that to the, the appropriate people, the emergency people, the emergency. Uh, and then they're going to need to know the time of the incident as well. When did it start? How long has it been burning? How long has it been released? Okay, very important. And then you're going to need a description of the incident and fire. Uh, whatever the incident might be, if it is a spill, you've spilled a ton of chemical on the ground and you're not sure what it is, that's the kind of thing you, the kind of things you need to know and relay to the emergency personnel. Okay? And then have you tried anything? Did you try and put out the fire and it got out of control and then you left and you evacuated? Okay? Things like that need to be known. And then obviously you need to arrange and meet with the fire department. If you have a spill or you have a, if there's a fire in your lab, you cannot leave. It is up to you. You are the most crucial person around. The emergency director is a big person. All you floor wardens are huge, but the people, the people where the fire actually originates or the incident happens, those are the most important people. Can anybody tell me why? They have. I know. <laughs> because because you know your lab. Okay, you know where your research is done. If you're in, um, if you have a bunch of chemicals in your lab, you can say, you know what, I got, oh, I got some compressed gas cylinders in the back, and I got some chemicals over here. You are super important. The fire department relies on your knowledge of your area. Okay, so the people who are involved in when the actual incident occurs, crucial to them figuring things out. Building emergency response plan, Don. Is your emergency director? And now, Don, are you for both buildings? Yeah. Okay. So Don is your emergency director. He's in. He's has an emergency response plan. This one is a little different. It's a great plan. He's going to merge it with the building emergency response plan, the standard uh, plan that's on campus. Every building on campus uh, should have their own burp. Okay. And within that burp, uh, you will have. Uh, you can download it from our website. Okay. And basically, you fill out your information personal to your own area. If you want to add to the building emergency response plan, have at it. We, what we have given you is just a base. So, Don, when you have, you might have some stuff that's expanded beyond what the BERT actually is at this what we have. But you know what? Build upon that. Make it as personalized as you want. We don't want a 550-page document, though. Nobody's going to look through it. No way. We want it to be very manageable, something where people can easily flip through it and know their roles or responsibilities associated with their building. Okay. So the emergency director is the person who coordinates the verb. Okay. The floor wardens are the, the people who make it all happen when something does go down. Okay. And then the local health and safety committee works with everybody to make sure that it's updated. Um, there's modifications. There's there's uh, things that are noticed, inspections that are done, where they come back and say, you know what, whoa, there's a plan, emergency procedure key plan outside the doors here, and it's wrong. It's got the fire extinguishers in the wrong spots. Okay, so you're all sort of working together to make sure that everything's updated and that perp is updated and looking good. Okay, and that's it. Great right information. So. 
So every year, make sure you review your plan. Things change, especially around here. You guys have noticed probably been impacted more than anybody with all the construction across campus. The middle area that was done here just basically threw a wrench probably in everybody's plans. Uh, and your, your assembly area, your designated meeting area, wherever you might be, probably changed. Okay? Because you didn't have access to that area anymore. So it's really important that you sort of review it, look at little changes and subtleties. Maybe a lab went under what renovation. If they have a fire extinguisher in their lab that's listed on there and they had to move it to a certain area, you've got to redo your plan, your emergency procedure plan that's, a, that's located on the walls of your buildings. Okay? So if somebody looks on that and says, whoa, i got to get to the emergency fire extinguisher, and they go and it's not there, that's an issue. Okay? So that's a part of the building, uh, making sure that that uh, burp is updated. Okay? All floor ones must understand the burp. It's not difficult. It's a real simple document, and if you think it needs uh, changing, let me know. This is what it's all about. We want to make sure that these documents, when we put them out, we make them as easy as simple for people to understand. If there is an issue with it and you see something you don't like, let us know because we're more than willing to change it. It's going to evolve as well. Okay. And then also make it, make it available for everybody. Everybody should have access to this. Okay, I don't know if you guys have a meeting room or somewhere where you post things, your safety board or anything like that. That's a great spot to put your building emergency response plan. Uh, if you have a website, if you have a safety tab, uh, which I'm recommending to all of the local health and safety committees to come up with some kind of a website portal for all your safety information, that's a great spot to have your building emergency response plan as well. Fire prevention. So, obviously, with your regular inspections, make sure you're looking around, doing inspections, looking and saying, wow, there's a big load over here. I can't believe this one room is just completely full of paper. Okay? Or, good housekeeping generally will mean that you will have less of a chance of having a fire or a serious incident associated with uh, any kind of uh, fire. So just make sure you keep things really clean and do your proper housekeeping. Review your building, your evacuation plan. Those regular fire drills are huge, and we'll go over those in a bit. And then other emergencies that are out there, we're going to talk a lot about those. Okay, so we have bomb threats, we have lockdown procedures. Um, there's a variety of things that can happen on campus here, uh, and we're going to try and get through them all, or a few of them anyway, the major ones. Fire prevention and evacuation. All right, going back to inspections. So when you go and do your inspection, take a look for uh, combust things that are accumulating. That general housekeeping thing, ignition ignition sources in your area. You guys are the, have a lot of electronics going on. Uh, take a look at your uh, worn extension cords. Uh, all of the things that you guys already know about. I really don't have to tell you. But one of the big places you can look for stuff like that is places you might not think. Your lab is probably great up to code, but then you go into your lunchroom and somebody's brought in their old toaster and it's sitting there and it's, and it's in disrepair. Okay? Something like that is very important. It always seems that in lunchrooms and, and office spaces, people always bring in their own stuff because you know what? It's not good enough for their house, but it's good enough for their office. That is not the case. Okay? Make sure you don't do that kind of thing. Make sure you buy brand new and make sure it's all properly um, CSA approved and whatnot. And then obviously, uh, sustainability coupled with um, the fact that they, um, they're a dangerous fire hazard. Portable heat heaters are not recommended <coughs> at all. Um, does anybody know of or do you guys use portable heaters in here? Or the, yeah, all of you, eh? <laughs> okay, good. Okay. Um, well, as you know, they're an energy drain. They're a huge energy drain. Um, and sustainability has told everybody and told me to tell everybody to not use them as much as possible. Obviously, it's maybe not going to be the biggest thing. Uh, from a fire code issue, um, I hope you have them some kind of a protocol in mind where they shut off at the end of the night because uh, they can't be left on when you're not there. If they are, if they are, that's where you're really increasing your chances of having a fire. Okay. So if they're on timer and you are using them appropriately, 
Uh, it's, I can understand in areas like in the cloud, maybe in the basement and stuff like that, where it's a little bit older and maybe the HVAC isn't working as well, um, then so be it. Uh, we always recommend a sweater, but take the, you can take that or leave that. Okay. And then obviously never leave your hazardous equipment uh, unattended. Okay. Um, do any of you leave experiments running all night? Overnight? Okay. Here and there. Okay. It's one of those things, um, you know, as long as it's under control, you reviewed that process to make sure that it's safe um, and that nothing can possibly happen or if something did happen, you have mitigated measures to make sure that it's going to be contained, um, that, uh, that you can probably process that. But it's really, that's really a, a real tough one for us to deal with. And I wear this pager that I have on right now with my time of the week. But I can't tell you how many times we get calls, and I'll get them at midnight, where the fire department calls me, and they say, I need to know what's in this lab because it's smoking. There's something going on. I'd love to process on. So we, we try to look in our database and find out if we have information for that particular lab, and then say, yeah, this is what they have. And then they thank us, and then off they go. And hopefully, we don't have to come on campus to give them more information. So take a look at your exit routes. As a part of your inspection, you go through, take a look at exit routes, make sure they're clear, okay? Don and I were walking around and we didn't see the piano, which was over in Scarf, but we did see this outside of your building right here, where it was right outside of emergency exit where you guys, the construction people would put that there, okay? It's not much, probably not gonna affect your egress too much, but it's something you wanna keep an eye on. Things that are happening outside your building, they're not going to consult you. They're just going to do it. And it's up to you to take a look here and there and make sure that, you know, that they know that they can't block your exit route. Okay? Make sure they're clear and unobstructed. Where there's actually regulations associated with how big those corridors should be. Not an issue probably on campus here. They're all going to be within those those widths, just know that when you do put your, you know, uh, garbage pail or whatever you're going to put in that hallway, you're restricting that width. And once it gets below a certain width, that 3.6 feet or the 3 feet in the sub corridor, now you're not within code. And if the fire, uh, Vancouver Fire Rescue Service does their own inspection, they're going to be um, not happy with us. Does anybody have any questions? Exit signs, often they're not working properly. That happens all the time. Everything else, all the lights around the area are working. Put the exit signs out. That's a part of your inspection as well. Just make sure they're working properly. They're lit, okay? And then also with uh, fire exit doors, make sure the self-closing hardware is working. So when you guys have your fire drill, uh, one of the things that's gonna happen, they're gonna pull that fire alarm all of the, a lot of the ones around here, all of the magnets are going to release and the fire doors are going to close. Some of them you'll find may not close. And if that's the case, that's the thing you want to report to your facility manager or call it into trouble calls or as it's now called service center. Okay? Because it's really important that those fire doors close. Do you guys know why the fire doors need to close? Even though it might be blocking you getting out from a certain area? stops the fire from migrating from building to building. Okay, for, me, for you guys here, if there's a fire over in McLeod, those fire doors are going to keep it from moving over to Kaiser. Okay. So it's really important those are all working properly. So as a part of your fire drill, those are some of the things that you'd be looking for. Okay, and they're never to be wedged open. If you wedge them open, now those magnets disengage to close, but they can't because you've got a wedge there. Okay, so it's really important that they're they're maintained and never reached open. Another thing you'll do is you're going to take a look at the fire extinguishers around your area. Uh, there's fire extinguishers at regular intervals throughout the entire building, and all of them should have a yellow tag, such as you see here, and you should be looking at them, making sure they were serviced at least or 
they've been serviced in the last year. Okay, if it's outside of that year, you can once again call trouble calls and say, hey, we've got about five fire extinguishers that haven't been done. ACME, who is the, the group that comes in, is contracted to come out here uh, to cert come out and certify them. They'll come by basically to certify a fire extinguisher. It's a pretty ridiculous process. They look at it, they say, oh, there's a little gauge on there. That looks in the green, good. They flip it over, they listen to the sediment drop. The sediment drops from the bottom of the fire extinguisher to the top. They flip it over, slap the tank on. Real easy. Okay, if it doesn't drop, that's an issue. The fire extinguisher is not going to work properly. So then they take the, that fire extinguisher, throw it away, and then they give you another one. If you see any hazards and you see a situation where you uh, don't feel it's appropriate, you've got to report it to your local health and safety committee, or you can report it to Don. Okay, he's your, or if it's a, and you can let people know as far floor wardens, you can let people know that you're the conduit to get stuff done. So if you go back to your area and you, everybody knows you're the floor warden, it's important that you communicate with them and say, you know what, this is. These are the kind of things you need to, it's great if they can help you out with this kind of thing, so you're not doing it all the time, but they can report this to you so then you can get things done as well in your particular area. Okay. And the local health and safety committee will help you deal with any of those issues. Okay, And they're the conduit to me, risk management services, and whoever else, whatever uh, issue you have. All right, uh, what do you do if you discover a fire? A few things you need to know, okay? What do you do when you hear the fire alarm? Uh, what's the shortest evacuation route, the location of the nearest pole alarm and fire extinguishers? And then what's the location of the, the assembly area, okay? So we're gonna go through all those things that you need to know, okay? What do you do when you discover a fire? Activate the fire alarm, okay? It's the first thing you do, okay? Leave the immediate area and then get everybody out. Okay. Attempt to control the fire if you're able to, if you're confident and able to do so. When you are confident to do so, do you know how big a fire would be where you would still try and fight it with a fire extinguisher? Is it like this big, or is it like this big, or is it like the size of me? They say campfire. Yeah. Okay. So I. A campfire, anything bigger than a campfire, you're out. Okay? Uh, you don't have a whole lot of time with the fire extinguisher. Don't chime in any anytime if you want to talk, but uh, if you don't have a lot of time, you have 12 to 15 seconds uh, with a fire extinguisher, so you've got to get it done. And I'll go over what you need to do when you're using a fire extinguisher real briefly. Okay. Do not use the elevators, and then proceed to the designated meeting area. And everybody should know where that designated area is, and then call 911 if it hasn't been done already. Okay. Obviously, do not enter the building, re enter the building. Um, as you know, when you guys evacuate, it's probably a great idea to, to take a look at the exits to make sure people aren't re entering the building. Um, it's not your job as a floor warden, I don't want to overburden you saying that you're sitting there with your you know, football gear on, blocking people from going into the building. But it is your job to let them know, you know what, you're going, you know, you're not allowed to go in. If they insist on going in, hey, what are you gonna do? But that's something you report to the emergency director, and then they tell that to the fire and fire rescue service. Okay. All right, so floor warnings, what do you guys do? Do you guys have safety equipment? Do you guys put on any busy vests or anything? No? Okay. It's great. Uh, I recommend having busy vests for all the floor wardens. Um, one of the things it does, for whatever reason, people seem to listen to somebody who's wearing a busy vest. <laughs> I have no idea why, but they seem to do so. Um, so if you can all be, have one of those, it's, it'll help a lot in, in being able to communicate with everybody. Uh, at no point do you ever put yourself in any danger, extra danger. If you can sweep your area and leave with your group, that is the goal. Okay? You're not running around, you're not trying to pull people out of their office because they're not wanting to leave. Your job is to get, sweep, 
move out with your group. Anybody who doesn't want to leave, you leave them there. Okay? Um, inform occupants, obviously, not to use the elevators. You've got to tell them all that kind of information. Proceed to the designated meeting area, and then give all the pertinent information that you have to the emergency director. Don will be waiting out at the designated meeting area for you, with, uh, waiting for, with, uh, to talk to emergency personnel. Okay, and then obviously do not re-enter the building under any circumstances. So when I talked about emergency procedure key plans, these are what you're going to find all over your buildings. Okay, these plans are very important. It's important that you know how to read them. When we do our little walk around after here, we'll sort of go over. You can see the live version of what you have in your building. Okay, and if you look. In, the, in your building, you have these plans here. The grade areas are your exit routes, okay? So when you look at your plan, and you're on your floor, your, your, um, wherever you might be in the building, <laughs> that'd be something. Um, those are your exit routes, okay? So you wanna let everybody know as well, if you're a floor warden, that communicate with your group to let them know, hey, in case I'm not around or if I don't get to you, that's your exit route. Also on the key plan, you'll notice there's a little red box on each of them. That's your designated meeting area. Okay, we'll get into that in a second. Your assembly areas, you have two, one for McLeod and then one for Kaiser. Okay, the one for McLeod right here is located right out in front of McMillan. Okay, on the grassy patch. Okay, and then for Kaiser, uh, it's if you look out from the Starbucks and you face out the building, and we'll go over this when we get out there, but you look on your key plan and it'll tell you that you're looking out, if you're at the front door, you look out through the Starbucks and you get the, uh, the seating area for the Starbucks and it's right across, again, on the other side of the grass. Okay, can you guys tell me why it's, I want it to be on the other side of the grass? So not, you have the pathway, grass, pathway, and then I want you on the other side of that grass. On the other side, on the very far side, as close to the Macmillan and Earth and Ocean Sciences as possible. The reason is, is you don't want to be in the way of the emergency services. Okay? So move yourself away from the building as far as possible. Emergency services are going to use this front area right here to access your building. Okay. Obviously, you lead by example, you walk, you're calm, you let everybody know, you know, almost like it's a drill, you want to get out to the spot, you want to move in a smooth manner, but stay calm, and then assist anyone who's having minor difficulties. Okay? If they're having huge difficulties, and this is something you want to monitor as well as a floor board, is just taking a look at your group and your area, here and there, I don't, I'm not asking you to walk through every day and see who's got a limp or who's got a broken leg, <laughs> but uh, it does happen, and it's a good thing to know for a forward to know that, you know what, Jimmy on the second floor of my wing, he's got a broken leg, there's no way he's getting down the stairs, okay? Because if that's the case, you want to be able to report that to the emergency, the fire department, and say, you know what, he's still in his... Uh, in his office because he can't get down the stairs. <coughs> okay. And it's not your responsibility to try and help him down. Now, if you can, so be it, but it's definitely not your responsibility. Okay, your responsibility is to get everybody out and then meet everybody out at the designated meeting area. So choosing a designated meeting area, I mentioned to you guys about where the fire, emerge, where the fire, fire, fire rescue service are gonna come. This is the campus map of how they're going to, their, their exit, or their entrance areas, where the emergency fire personnel are going to be. These are bollards at the bottom here, these circles, and then all along Main Mall here is where they're coming up to deal with whatever they have to deal with. Okay, so stay out of the way, and that's a great thing to know, so that when you guys do move out to your designated area, you're across the way and out of the way of the bank of the fire. 
and Don, you could probably include this in your, in your plan as well. Do not use the elevator. I don't know how many times I have to tell you this, but it's really important. There's a random occurrence where these elevators will go to the heat source. So if you go and ride on one, two things can happen. Uh, you could, chances are you won't get trapped, but there's a chance of that. Uh, the other thing is it could actually go to the area where the fire is. Okay, you might press floor two and it'll bump up to floor five for whatever reasons and take you to a place where you do not want to be. So do not use the elevator. That's what the, the stairs are there for evacuation and emergencies. There is, um, not the one in the back, the one in the back. don't use the elevator. All right, if it's safe to do so, just like the doors close for, for barriers for fire, uh, same thing with windows and your office doors, <coughs> close them, okay, as you leave. If you're in your lab and you have a fire in your lab, don't just run out, run out and close that door. If you have a chance, which I'm not recommending you risking your life in any way, shape, or form, but if you have a chance, uh, close the window. Because fire needs oxygen to breathe, and live, and survive. The less you give it, the more chance, the less chance it's going to spread. <coughs> All right, areas of refuge. This building does not have any, we found, right? So we never found any areas of refuge in these buildings. Um, generally, I'm surprised there's not one in McLeod because back in the yeah, go for there it. is a in the McLeod. Is there it's something? It's, yeah. it's not. Is uh, it posted? It, there's no signage there, but on the uh, on the plan. On the emergency procedure, I looked on the key plan and I didn't see an R on any of the key plans. We'll take a look at them because on the in the McLeod. The old buildings, they all have seem to have areas of refuge. That's a very standard thing. And everybody knows what an area of refuge is. It's where people will go in case they can't get down the stairs. That way it's a one point access for the emergency personnel to come in and rescue those people um, in case something's, if there's an emergency, okay? Um, if you do not have areas of refuge, what you do is it's sit in place, stay in place. Now, if somebody is ha if somebody's right where the fire is and they can't get down the stairs, well, you move them out of them, but then you keep them on the floor away from the fire, and then you, you put them in an area, you know where that is, and then you egress, tell the Vancouver Fire Rescue Service, hey, we got a guy up in 2173, and he, he can't get down the stairs, and the, and the, the fire's just down the wall for you. Okay? That's what you do. Okay? It's not your responsibility, like I mentioned before, to lug them down the stairs, okay, and hurt yourself. It's your responsibility just to tell where that guy is, okay. Does everybody know what an enunciator panel is? It's probably maybe the first time you've heard of it, but your enunciator panel is located in every building has one, okay. Sometimes they have two. Uh, I think this one only has one, right? For, for Kaiser and McLeod has its own enunciator panel as well. Okay, and then that's your panel basically is tell you where the fire department goes right there because they want to know where the fire is. And they know that by where the sprinklers have gone off. Okay, so they'll take a look at that and then it's your, probably the first place they'll go if something happens. They'll take a look at the that's your panel and they'll go, yep, yeah, okay, it's in this zone. Uh, and boom, they can, they can head off to that area and deal with whatever they have to deal with. Okay, um, on a routine, if something does happen to your building, Don may actually be asked to go with the fire department to that area and then converse with the fire department and he will know, hey, you know what, that's my lab. Um, yeah, we, we've got this and this and this in there and uh, off they go, okay. Real quickly, real cheap little diagram of what happens when there's an emergency, but real simple. The floor wardens report everything to the emergency director, okay, tell them what he needs to know, then he reports it to the Vancouver Fire Rescue Service. If for some reason, floor wardens, one floor warden, somebody has some pertinent information that needs to go to the fire department right away, you can go above your emergency director and tell him, tell the fire department, okay? So it's just a, just a, just a, just so you know that there's no problem with doing that, okay, as floor wardens. As 
hazardous materials. Have you guys had a hazardous materials call at all here, ever? No? Ah, mercury, that'll do it. Okay. Good stuff. Um, hazmat is a little bit of a different issue on campus, okay? You want to call your 911 uh, right away. Um, one of the things we're finding across campus with hazardous materials is people are not willing to call about them. They think that they can either deal with themselves or they're too embarrassed to call 911 or they think it's going to be too much of a disruption to call 911. Um, I'm telling you, error on the side of caution, and absolutely just call 911. Uh, we had a group in a building where they called every single person at risk management services trying to find an answer. It was during lunch hour. They went through, it ended up taking them about 30 minutes to get a hold of somebody before we told them, call 911. Okay, and that's big time loss. Okay, and if it is a hazardous material, who knows what's happening, if it's in training in the, in the building ventilation, it could be a serious issue, okay? How the process works, just so you know, uh, thank you, Fire Hall 10 on campus, okay? Basically gets the call from, there's a call that goes into ECOM, ECOM tells them what's going on, Fire Hall 10 is here in like five to 10 minutes tops, right here dealing with the issue. They sort of assess the situation and they say, ooh, boy, no problem, I can deal with this, or holy cow, this is huge. At that point, they'll say to Fire Hall 18, who is our major hazmat truck, who's located probably 15 minutes away, they tell them, get down here, we need you guys, and that hazmat truck will come. You probably won't have the hazmat incident dealt with for probably close to 30 or 40 minutes once you call. The key is, and in everything, is the fact that everybody's safe, okay? So if Vancouver Fire and Rescue Service Fire Hall 10, they come here and they say, wow, this is too big for us to deal, they're evacuating everybody. Everybody gets out of the building, okay? They deal with the issue, and it doesn't really matter the time frame it isn't as big to them. They just want to make sure everybody's safe, okay? So that's sort of how the process works. So don't be surprised is if, you know, half hour goes by and still no fire people have entered into the building yet. Okay. And once again, the whole thing, especially with a hazmat issue, be available. Find the person, whoever reported it, Don, if somebody comes to you and they say, uh, you know, I just spilled this stuff in my lab, that guy isn't going on the coffee break. You're keeping that person with you, and you're going to go with them outside, and he's going to stay with you because that particular person is so important to the situation. Okay? Okay, what's wrong with this photo? It's got a sign, it's got the NED sign. Uh, no, it's all about the chemistry laboratory. What is all labs that have any kind of hazardous work going on in them should have something on it. Should have some kind of placard like what we found over at Don's area. Okay? If you come across a lab that doesn't have this on there and they have chemicals in their areas, okay? Make sure you call us, your risk management services will come over and give you a sign just like that, as Marcus knows, right? Okay? Um, if you do find that, just let us know. It's not up to floor wardens to go and inspect that kind of thing, but if you happen to come across it, you can quick call to us and we'll come and investigate and then decide whether or not they need a sign or not. Okay? The hazmat team relies on that sign to know what they're going into, okay? That's one of the biggest things they'll do is they'll look at that sign and go, oh, wow, there's all kinds of stuff in here, and that'll determine how they enter the room, okay? So it's really important that those signs are posted at, uh, all over campus in the appropriate rooms for materials, <coughs> okay? If and when they come, this is something they look, this is what it sort of looks like. They gown, they have to decontaminate, and then uh, get into the building, and after they, they get in and then they decontaminate when they come out. 
um, and then get us set up. They have, usually have a, some kind of an incident command right outside of your building. <laughs> All right, so anyways, this video basically shows, um, has anybody ever seen a Christmas tree go on fire? Okay, literally like, they're like bombs. It's, it's, if they're dry and they haven't had water in a while, they go off like insane. So this is set up in the corner of a Christmas tree, and the Christmas tree basically gets lit at the very bottom really small, and then it literally it doesn't explode, but it lights up the room. And I always ask, at what point do you think you could fight this fire? And usually, within four seconds, people are saying no. So when it gets to about 50 seconds, it just goes black because it's completely engulfed with smoke and you're, you're done. So under a minute, and it's, there's no way you're even surviving in that room. Okay. And one of the biggest things we learn with that is if you do have a fire in your area, get to it quickly. Okay. Your fire extinguishers, it's really important to know where they are and why those key plans have to be updated because somebody has a, we have a fire in this corner here, okay, and it goes off, I have to be able to get to a fire extinguisher and get back before, as quickly as possible, okay? And that's the lesson learned with that video. When you're dealing with fire extinguishers, there's four different classes of fire extinguishers. You have your class A, which is just your combustibles, which is normal paper, cloth, wood, trash. And then you have your class B, which is flammable liquids, okay? Class C, which deals with electrical wiring. And then your class D, which is combustible metals, which I'm assuming, Don, you guys have nothing here that's combustible metal, right? No, not you guys used to? Oh, okay. So, if you do see one, a uh, combustible metal one, uh, make sure you let Don or myself know and we'll probably get them out of the building because they shouldn't be here if there's no combustible metals in there and they're very rare. I think we have two on campus uh, and one's over, obviously over in chemistry. Okay. Once again, you're safe and confident, you're ready to deal with this fire. Okay, it's small and contained and you have an exit route behind you. Yes? Question about the yeah. fire extinguishers. Yeah. What if you use the wrong line? Like, what if you just use the closest line? It might, like, well, might not put it out. It just doesn't really work. It's yeah. Not, it's and not I'll get into I'll get into why you should be confident with any fire. Okay. Real quick. Here. Okay. Yeah. Um, so when you're when you're safe and confident, ready to deal with the the fire, okay, and you have an exit route behind you. If there's a fire right in the middle of this room, sorry, I'm probably moving my camera. I'm not going to fight it from here. Okay. I'm going to walk over to the door and then face the fire facing this way so I always have an exit route behind me, okay? Never ever seal yourself off, okay? So make sure when you fight the fire you have something behind you where you can get out in case it does get out of control. Use the pass method, okay? So you grab your, your fire extinguisher, you pull the pin, Okay, and I'll talk to you a bit about what those fire extinguishers, what they have on them that you might be afraid of if you didn't see it. But you pull the pin, you aim the fire extinguisher at the base of the flames. Have any of you done fire extinguisher training before? Okay, what happens if you aim above the flames or at the middle of it? Nothing. Okay, you basically are just, you know, watching your fire get bigger and bigger. Okay, you go at the base, that's where it's originating, you spray right there. And then you squeeze the trigger and then sweep the fire extinguisher at the base of the flames. Okay? And when you do that, you do it properly, because you only have 12 to 15 seconds with that thing, the fire goes out. Okay? If it's small enough. So which ones, which extinguishers do you guys use? Have you seen any of do you guys have any of the silver ones? Good. Okay. Silver ones just are pressurized water. So basically it's a stream of water that you can use on obviously just simple A stuff, which is your combustible paper, cloth, wood, all that kind of thing, right? Uh, you see your B and C fire extinguishers, we don't even have any of those on campus, but we have all, we always have ABCs. Generally across campus we have ABC fire extinguishers. So the answer to your question is you'll always have an ABC wherever you go. Okay, so you won't have to worry about, hey, is this combustible paper, can I use this one, or is this a liquid, you have an ABC that covers it all. Okay? 
And that's what the class Ds look like. They vary in color randomly. For, I don't know why, but they can come in yellow. But if it's an odd color, not red, like your normal ABC, let us know and we can find out what it is. Okay. You guys will see the fire department hoses across in your buildings here. They're not for your use. You're not pulling out the fire department hoses and going and uh, trying to put out fires that way. You're only using the fire extinguishers. Sometimes the fire extinguishers are located in the cabinet with the fire hose. You can access that and grab the fire extinguisher if you'd like, um, but that hose is not for your use. Okay, it's strictly for the fire department. Okay. Does anybody have any questions about fire? Before I get into earthquake safety, just a real quick blurb about you as floor wardens, how you sweep your area. One of the biggest things you should know, one of the biggest things you should consider is how big your area is. So take a look when you go back to your area and you know you have to sweep from here to here, how manageable is that? Wow, Don's given me uh, a massive area. I have to sweep my entire floor. It's going to take me probably about five minutes to do it if I run. Okay? That's probably not manageable. So you probably want to split the duty with somebody else and get somebody else to be a fire a floor warden in your area. So take a look at your area. Make sure you can sweep. Decide how you're going to sweep. Okay? Are you going to start here and you're going to finish here? And you always finish at an exit route. So you start away from the exit route and then move your way back to the exit route. That way you're leaving with everybody. Okay? So consider that when you go back to your area. Does anybody, anybody participate in ShakeOut this year? Good. Okay. Um, it's a great exercise. If you do it once a year, I think you get to learn of what's going on in your lab or what's going on in your, in your room or your office space. Uh, take a look at how awkward it is to get under your desk and how you have way too many things under it and you don't fit. Okay. Things like that are great learning. Uh, things that, that end up happening from that, as well as what, what could possibly happen, worst case scenario stuff, and you start to envision how you would deal with that emergency. Okay. Think in terms of what you should do in an event of an earthquake, and it's great to think of those things when you're at home with your families. Okay? And think about where your exit route, think about when you go home from here, even what you're doing at your own home, where are you exiting to, where is your family meeting place, so on and so forth. So the classic drop, cover, and hold, if you participate in ShakeOut, you know what that is. Uh, basically, you're getting under something sturdy, okay, and you're holding on to that thing so it doesn't leave your head and neck, and you're covering your neck as well and holding on to it, making sure that nothing is hitting you in the head. The most important thing you're trying to protect in the event of an earthquake is your head. Okay, however you do it, you're good to go. If you're in this room, for example, a lot of us will flood to those tables potentially. They're on wheels, so they're going to move. Okay, so you really have to hold on to them. But if you're in an area where you don't have anything, head and neck, and you just have a bunch of chairs, what are you going to do? You have two options. One, you can grab a chair, cover your head and neck, okay, and duck. Okay, you can do that. Uh, Two, you can better grab a chair and move to an inner wall. Okay, inner walls are great for support, outer walls are bad. Okay, outer walls that generally have windows, and if anything's going to fall, it's going to come from an outer wall. And then also make sure you're looking around and making sure that uh, there's nothing that's going to fall on your head. Okay. Get under the tables, you'll see here the best photo we can find is of kids doing it properly, okay, where they're covering their head and neck. If you're in um, a lecture theater, yep. Four sciences. Yeah, that's right. Nicely done. Good call. Uh, if you're in a lecture theater, okay, get between the seats. You can crouch in there. Once again, the debris is what's going to hit you, okay? Don't worry about. Uh, the complex is falling in and compacting on you, you can't do anything about that. What you can do, and where people are generally hurt, is by the debris. So the more you protect yourself from debris, the better off you're going to be. Okay? And I didn't mean to lie. Alright. 
Has anybody heard of this? Okay. So we don't support at UBC. We do drop, cover, and hold. We do not support the triangle, triangle of life. Um, basically, what it's saying is if everything falls magically, you can find a void. If you position yourself properly, you will be in that void. Okay? It's it's leads to being out, of, out in open spaces and not doing the appropriate thing to, to shield yourself from the debris. Okay, and that's where people around here generally are hurt. In countries like um, you know the horrible thing that happened over in Bangladesh, where everything just uh, compacted, um, those are the those are the voids they're talking about. Defending against that and finding an open space for that, and that's with poor construction of buildings. Okay. We don't have that here. We're all about the debris. Okay, so that's what we want to focus on. Um, there you go. Once again, if you're office space and you notice there's a bunch of things that it could land on your head, maybe you don't want to be in that area once the shaping starts. Maybe move to somewhere else. Look at fixtures that are above, whether it be Marcus's area where that's going to fall on his head, uh, or if you're somewhere where books and stuff are stored high on shelves and they're heavy, stay away from those areas. Even better is part of your inspection if you're looking around, make sure there's nothing heavy on shelves. That's one of the big things you would do as a part of your inspection. Make sure there's nothing that can fall on you. Okay, All heavy things that could hurt you if they fall should be stored at low levels. Okay, so we tell people most injuries they occur by falling objects coming out of the building. So people prematurely leave the building or they just run out in panic. Those people, I think in New Zealand was an, ex uh, an example of that where people were generally hurt because they left the building early. So while the shaking was happening, they left the building. Those people were either injured or killed from stuff falling off of the building. Okay, inside is safer, believe it or not. Okay, so they tell you, shaking stops, count 60 seconds, wait for everything to settle, okay, and then leave the building. It might take a lot, and it's probably going against your instinct to flee, but if you count that 60 seconds and, and wait, and then leave the building, that's the safest point at which you can leave. Okay. You can see, this is an example of what you what could happen outside of a building. If you stayed in that building, you'd be fine. If you decide to leave, you're not doing so hot. Okay? And then obviously don't re-enter the buildings unless you have been advised that, that they're safe, okay? Um, we're looking into a cross campus having some kind of a, a way of measuring that. Um, it's not yet underway. Um, but that's something we want to look at and have a group that basically goes and puts little tags on buildings saying, yep, safe or not safe uh, in the event of an earthquake does happen. Okay. Obviously, watch for hazards, power lines, trees, fires. That's a great point for your designated meeting area. Um, if your designated meeting area is, a bunch of, is around a bunch of trees or power lines, you might want to revisit where your emergency, your earthquake meeting area might be because you wouldn't want to put it in an area where stuff could fall in. Okay? All right, lockdown. This is a, it's a difficult one. Uh, was anybody around for the biosciences issue? Okay. One of the things with that is, um, is that it was, um, the big thing was the communication. And the communication not only with the public UBC, but the public but with RCMP and so on and so forth. So that's something that UBC is working diligently on right now. Um, but to go over what a lockdown is, what is it, and why is it used rather than uh, just normal evacuation. Okay, What they want to do is they want to keep the area controlled. The goal of the RCMP if, in the event of some uh, a threatening individual is to make sure that they can control the scene. If you're out and about running around, they have no control. They don't know where anybody is. They don't know how they, that's not control. You're assisting the RCMP by staying in your office areas and keeping the windows closed and staying down and 
and low. Okay? Your buildings, generally not bad. I've been in pharmaceutical sciences and they're a little bit worried because everything's glass. Okay? They have glass everywhere where they feel like they, in the event of a lockdown, they don't know what they're going to do. Okay? Your guys' building, think about what you're going to do in the event of a lockdown, but generally around these areas, a lot of it, well, you guys have glass as well up in the Bay Area. Um, you might want to buy blinds. So pharmaceutical science is actually looking into buying blinds. Okay? But make sure you're hidden and you lock the doors. Okay. There's two types of lockdowns. There's the one within your building where you're locking down in your own room. And then there's the one where they're over in McMillan and the assailant's over there and you're locking your building. Okay? And making sure nobody can get into it. Okay? Once the threatening individual is in that building, he's not getting anywhere else. He's just going to stay in that building or he's going to be out in the common area. He will not enter your building because you have locked it. What you need to know is you're staying hidden and you're staying in place. Okay. Okay. And this is the general procedures you would do. Secure your door and windows, close curtains or blinds. If you don't have curtains or blinds in your area, mind if you're in your labs or office spaces, maybe you can ask to have those put in. Okay. Stay away from windows and doors, absolutely. Uh, be seated below the window level, if it's above, if it's above the grade. Uh, stay low and quiet, and then rate instructions from desperate for emergency personnel. Okay? And once again, to you guys, I don't know how they're going to ever decide to communicate who emergency personnel is and how you trust that it is emergency personnel. My thought is, is don't trust anybody. Once it's done, what's going to happen is if you have your handheld device and as long as it's on silent, first thing you do is shut off your handheld device and make sure it's on silent. <laughs> Not like that. <laughs> <laughs> and you will look at it, and on the UBC webpage, it will completely be taken over. Okay, and it will only show what's going on with regards to lockdown. They will say, once it's done, on the website, which is completely secure, they will say, the, the event is over and you're free to, you're, everything's done. Okay, RCMP has secured the building and you're good to go. Once you read that, then you're safe. Somebody's running around saying they're RCMP, I don't know if I'm trusting them. Okay? Tell you the truth. Right? So, until you hear, until you see that, that's the best way to communicate for now. We are working on a variety of things. Uh, the website, obviously, we, that's been in, in works and that's going to work if, if there is a lockdown. Uh, we have a text message system. So uh, when you sign as an employee or a, a student, you have your CWL and your, your, your login and you have your personal information area where you get paychecks and all that. There's an emergency contact information tab in there. If you haven't put your cell phone number in there, please do. Uh, there will be a mass email put out in case something does happen. Any kind of emergency where the whole campus need to be notified, you will get that text message. Okay? And it will be a very bland text message, I warn you. It will basically say something along the lines of, there is a situation over at Kerner, and you are to stay away from that area. Okay? But at least you know, and you're not moving into that area. Okay. Uh, Email is broadcast building specific. Um, this is another something, Don, you should think about in thinking about a tree and to communicate with your area. If something does happen and you need to communicate with your floors, you should have a contact person, which might be your floor wardens, to say, there's something going on down here. We have a person who is threatening people, uh, we need to we need to let everybody else on the floors know. Okay? So if you have that phone tree or that email tree or some kind of a, a listserv thing that you could get going, that would be great. And that will help in, in dealing with those situations. Okay? Digital signage will be also be taken over. 
So if you have digital signage in your building here, uh, we have it goes all goes to a main conduit. Well, we can take that over. Okay, and not we as in the RMS, but the university will take over their own signage and they'll send it out to all of the entire campus, letting everybody know what's going on. Okay, and there's high tech and low tech. Don't be afraid of the low tech stuff. Walking around telling people isn't the worst case scenario. Okay, and that's especially good for thinking about earthquakes in that if the fire belt doesn't work, or then you want to alert people in other ways in order to um, get them to even to do shakeout. We thought about one of the way, great ways of, of starting shakeout was to actually do a blow horn, potentially, or have a bell, some kind of a, their own bell to go off, or even an email saying, shakeout's now, and off you go. It's one way of testing that, uh, that email to see how it works. <coughs> 